So welcome everybody to our Post-TM Forum Management World 2012 webinar. Uh, my name is Jason Marchek and I'm the Managing Director for News Insights and Analysis for RCR Wireless News. Um, and my panelists and I today are going to discuss some of the key themes and happenings that we saw at the TM Forum event which was held in Dublin last week. Um, before we get started, I would like to just provide you with a, a, a very quick um, bit of background on RCR Wireless News. Uh, we've been around since 1981, and that is a pretty long time. I think a lot of you know us well from, from the writing that we've done over the years. Um, and um, I'm joined today by uh, a couple of distinguished panelists. Uh, first off is Sheer Levine. She's the uh, directing analyst for NextGen OSS and policy for Infinetics. And you can see Cher's background there. She brings 15 years of experience um, specifically uh, to this industry. And she's worked at a number of research firms as well as uh, some of the leading trade publications in the industry. Um, also joining me today is Justin Vanderlan, who is a senior analyst with Analysis Mason. And Justin has more than 20 years of experience, again, in, uh, in this marketplace and has worked for essentially a who's who of the, of the big players in the space. You can see uh, from the list there, IBM, Telcordia, TM Forum, um, just, just to name a few. And so um, I think without further ado, what we're going to do is, is go ahead and get started. Um, the, the format of the, of, the, of the presentation today is essentially going to be, we'll give a, a, a rundown of the show and a little bit of a background on the, on the event for those that weren't able to make it. And then we'll go through some of the key topics and, and developments that we've seen come out of the show. Um, we'll do this for about 45 minutes. And then we will uh, we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for, uh, for Q&A. So if you do have a question, um, feel free to submit it using the question panel on your, on your dashboard there. And then we'll get to as many, uh, as many questions as we can um, in the live broadcast. And if, if you know, there happens to be more questions and that we can address, we will uh, we'll be sure to get back to you offline. And likewise, if you have any follow-up questions, um, feel free to, to, to contact us. Um, so, uh, you know, with that, let's just go ahead and get started. And um, a little bit of background, the TM, the Management World event is the TM Forum's showcase event of the year. They hold several around the world, but this is their, this is their big event. Um, it generally features about two to 3,000 attendees, uh, the overwhelming majority of which are made up from the group's membership, and, and that membership consists of both uh, equipment providers, technology providers, as well as uh, network operators and communication services providers. Um, you know, this, for the last couple of years, the event has been held in Dublin. Um, next year, it was announced that it will be held and it'll be moving back to, to where it was held previously in, in Nice, France. And, and to be honest, that was one of the biggest topics of conversation at the show. People were very interested to find out where, you know, if the show was going to be in Dublin or, or move somewhere else. Um, one of the highlights of the uh, of the event is their Catalyst program, and it's generally uh, what what it really consists of is a is a group of of almost workshops that are put together in order to to facilitate collaboration between uh, network operators and uh, the technology suppliers to work on a very specific problem and, and come to the show with their uh, with their results and, and demonstrate the results of, of what they were able to come up with in collaboration so that's a relatively unique um, aspect of the management world show and um, you know that's something that we'll we'll go into a bit more depth on later on but you know before we, we move into the the topics I'd like to just open it up for uh, for Shira and Justin to you know share some overall impressions of the show and, and give a bit of background of their uh, their involvement with the show over the years so Shira if you want to kick us off yeah sure thing hey Jason um, I've been going to the show for an embarrassingly long time. I think my first TM Forum show was when it was still the Network Management Forum, and that would have been back in about 1996 when it was just a handful of booths and a lot of card tables. So it's, it's been interesting for me to watch these events evolve. And, and I think the TM Forum has done a really good job in increasing its relevance. So in, in the old days, it was kind of the geek show um, talking a lot about Corbra and OSS interfaces and, and you know really sort of basically just OSS, and 
done a good job of expanding into the larger realm of telecom software, um, as well as expanding out of traditional telecom into areas like cable, enterprise, defense. Um, so it, it's been a, a pretty cool evolution. Um, I, I think, and, and I'm sure um, Justin can, can pick up on this a bit, because I'm pretty sure he saw the same things I did. but. You know, the big focus is obviously on analytics. That's what everyone was talking about. It, you know, it seems to have become the new buzzword. A little bit less focus on customer experience management, which I found kind of refreshing. I, I found the conversations I had about CEM had more meat to them than, than maybe I would have seen even at the uh, America show in Orlando last fall. Um, and, and the other thing I, that I noticed, in, um, it just seems a little bit a little bit smaller than last year. I don't know whether it was a function of people not wanting to go back to Dublin, or and we'll see a difference when it goes back to Nice, or the fact that Mobile World Congress is really starting to take an enormous chunk of everyone's event budgets and travel budgets, and that's going to be a bit of a challenge for smaller shows like Management World going forward. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I, I, I think every show, honestly, is seeing that. We noticed that at CTIA um, uh, just a few weeks prior. I mean, it was. We're still, they, they said 30,000 attendees, but it was decidedly more subdued than, than it has been in the past. And I think that the, the Mobile World Congress effect is really having its, uh, is really being felt on a lot of shows. Um, but Justin, can you, uh, you want to introduce yourself and, uh, and share some quick thoughts with us? Yeah, so hi, Justin. Um, yeah, much like Cher, I've, 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 been, I've been to countless numbers of these shows, and it has grown over the years. I mean, I think probably, you know, we, we do forget that, um, you know, there have been a number of other smaller OSS, BSS shows which are either uh, disappearing or have disappeared completely. So if you've got an OSS or BSS product and uh, you're interested in that space, I mean, certainly this is the, the premier show to go to, to go and get all the things in one place. Very good. And um, so I guess what we'll do now is just jump right into the first topic, and I think Sherrod sure did today. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Um, Sierra did a nice job of teeing up um, one of the uh, one of the, the the sort of the core topics that um, that were really on display at the show. I mean, I, I don't think you could swing a dead cat without hitting some sort of printed reference to analytics in some form or fashion at the event. Which is, I mean, you know, I, not to say that that's a bad thing. Um, but at least from my perspective, what it did was create a little bit of a kind of a cacophony, if you will, that in some ways can be confusing or and, and possibly even overwhelming. When you hear so many vendors talking about the same theme, it becomes, you know, a challenge, but but actually necessary to, to sort of dig in and, and try to differentiate between who's bringing what to market and how they're actually. Uh, how they're actually proposing to implement, you know, in, in this case, analytics to, to help solve problems. So my first question to the panelists is, um, you know, can you guys, given your given your experience and background with the show and, and, and all the things that these vendors bring to the table, can you give us a sense of, of what you saw from the technology providers in terms of how they're approaching analytics and, and, and potentially uh, differentiating their offerings? Um, and then also, you know, some of the, share some thoughts on some of the things that you feel are important for service providers to be paying attention to as they, you know, as they evaluate the extent to which they need to uh, they need to take advantage of analytics tools. Um, and so, share go ahead. So, yeah, happy to have a conversation. So, um, so analytics, as you say, is is, is been hot. It's been hot for some time. I, I think that um, I suppose a couple of things come to mind. Certainly, uh, current OSS and BSS vendors, and there's a broad brush, I know, but. Uh, certainly, vendors have been looking very carefully at how they can take current offerings in the market and add analytics to them, what analytics can actually provide to them. And I think that's, that's certainly a very sensible way of adding some feature or value to their current installation. So that can be, analytics can be applied to a number of different scenarios. Obviously, CM is one of them. Um, but also other areas as well, if you're looking at uh, things like network planning and other, other things, which are looking at large amounts of data, looking at uh, modeling. Uh, that data in some way, and then trying to predict, and uh, therefore uh, do a better better job at uh, doing what you're doing in the first place. Um, but the uh, I suppose there are also um, some ge uh, generalist analytic uh, players, the people like the SAS Institute, for example, who were at the show as well, um, and have struggled a little bit in the sense that they've uh, they've had their sort of core areas, certainly in terms of uh, customer insight. And that's uh, obviously installed at a number of operators today and has been for a number of years. 
Uh, and that tool is perfectly capable of being applied to a number of different other use cases, um, but they struggle to do that. And I think the and one of the lessons here, I guess, for any vendor, indeed, uh, in any CSP looking at uh, at a tool set, essentially that the tool is only part of the story. You've got to really understand the data behind it, and then and sort of the secondary bit is you've got to understand the models uh, uh, that, that can be applied to that data. So, having a deep um, expertise in you know in uh, in uh, service management, for example, doesn't mean you're going to have a, a great understand a great understanding of uh, any other space. You've got to um, you've got to have an understanding of the models and the data associated with it. So. Even though it's possible to apply yourself to different areas, it, it might not be sensible for you to do so. And I think there's been a bit of learning going on there. And certainly from the conversations that I was having at, um, at Mobile uh, Management World, um, you know, the CSPs were also in the same sort of boat. They, they knew they had to do something about it, driven by you know, topical things like uh, uh, big data, which of course is collecting all sorts of partially uh, formatted data. Um, which is really useful, uh, but they didn't know how to necessarily utilize that. And the vendors, I don't think, have been particularly helpful to them in trying to uh, accelerate, understand, and apply that and that knowledge and that data which is now available to them. They just see a huge amount of data um, and a huge uh, complexity of models, which hasn't helped them to, uh, to bring together a, uh, a coherent business case, case and tool sets to apply that information. So there's a bit of confusion, I think, within the market space at the moment as to what people should do first, and uh, how they should do it. Agreed, from yeah. perspective. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree. I sort of cringed every time I saw some sort of a, a collateral or marketing material around analytics products or analytics solutions, um, the same way I sort of feel about CEM, because I don't really feel like it's, it's an issue that can be addressed by an out-of-the-box solution, both CEM and analytics. You really need to have that understanding of the problem you need to solve. It's more of a, a holistic thing for the entire enterprise as opposed to a point solution. You can certainly implement point analytics solutions. Um, you know, I sort of differentiate between analytics with a small a and am analytics with a capital A. The, the former is more a solution that can analyze, say, your CDR data or any data that comes out of your service assurance solution. And there's certainly value in that. But I think that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about really being able to pull data from multiple sources, whether it's HLR, HSS data, or AAA data, or customer care data, and, and potentially pull it together to get some real insight into the customer, into how the network is behaving, get into some real-time um, actions you might want to take via some sort of a policy management. That's not a product. That's, that's more of a discipline. It's a mindset. And, and I felt like a lot of the the conversations at last week in Dublin kind of um, hid that fact. Agreed. I was just going to um, jump in. And, and, and Sarah, you sort of you hit on it a little bit, but I just wanted to throw that out. I mean, it seemed like last year, um, and, and not just at Management World, but, but as, a, as a theme in the industry, customer experience management was was really front and center. Um, and, and this year, um, I think as you pointed out rightly, sure, that the, 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 ta the, the discussion was much more focused on analytics, which is, is a part of the solution, but certainly not a, uh, you know, the, the whole boat in terms of a, of a holistic CEM. Do you, is, is there any, any conclusions that can be drawn with respect to that? Is it a, is it a matter of Operators and, and vendors as well taking a step back and saying, "Okay, we need a, a phased approach to implementing this." Or, um, you know, I think are there any are there any insights that can be drawn from the to, from the way that the messaging has shifted, sort of from the the macro, sort of down to a, a subset of what a CEM solution would be. Maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but I I would like to think that that's the case. That there was this realization that CEM encompasses a number of things, but it's important. Analytics is a very important part of of a CEM solution. So you know, let's step back and address this part of the puzzle, and then we'll talk about implementing a larger CEM strategy. Like I said, that might be a little bit optimistic, but I'd like to think that at least some players are thinking that way. Gotcha. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I, I would just add one more point to that, Jason, as well. Um, I think that, um, you know, I think maybe uh, the definition of CEM also is a little different depending on who you speak with. 
So, um, you know, CEM, uh, if you go and speak to a service assurance guy, is essentially the next logical step that they've made from fault to performance to, uh, to service management is the next thing after that, um, incorporating the end user uh, quality assessments, if you like, or their uh, feeling how that service is running. Um, and that's sort of really network orientated more than anything else. Um, and of course, you know, there's a whole other different collection of uh, touch points which uh, CEM can incorporate. Um, but this starts being quite, quite, a, for quite a complex product set. You know, if you're dealing with inputs from uh, customer care people, how your web experience is, and indeed how your you know, interactive voice uh, handling systems are working, etc. All these are potential input points for a CEM system. Um, but I think the reality is that you can't do everything all at once. You've got to start somewhere. And I think that the guys who seem to have taken the lead in this area seem to be in the service assurance guys who, frankly, have sort of you know, come, come from that direction. Um, and uh, sort of fault and service management area. And I think that, that those are the guys who are making the play at the minute. And uh, it's just because I think they've narrowed that whole field down to something which is deliverable and meaningful from a, uh, from a business perspective. But it doesn't mean the, uh, the others won't join in with the, other, with the other input points. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Um, so the, the next topic that we are going to address is is really, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, the fundamental reason why the, uh, the, the the TM forum exists and and why the folks come together in in Dublin and now Nice next year, um, and that's that's OSS BSS. And, and and one of the things in speaking before the webinar, we noticed that there seemed to be a a a pullback, I would say, from the the transformation rhetoric that again, you know, maybe we've heard over the you know the previous twelve or or, or more months. Um, and I think that's uh, you know again it could be a matter of of pragmatism coming into um, coming into into the into the the discussion. It's a it's a the idea of transformation is a, a pretty big um, pretty big elephant to to try to swallow, I imagine. But um, I'm wondering, um, you know, if the, if the panelists could talk a little bit about and share some of their insights on, I guess from a high level, you know. The, the whole, if that notion kind of resonated with you guys, did we see a, a sort of a pullback from the, uh, you know, from the overall transformation rhetoric and then, you know, maybe digging in a little bit? Um, if so, what are some of the things um, that, that operators need to, to look for and consider as they, as they do this in a more iterative fashion? And so, Justin, if you want to jump in, that's fine. Yeah, no, I certainly, I, I completely, I, I would uh, say it's certainly the case. There was little talk of you know, mass transformations, um, certainly in the market space. I would say that there, you know, from a geographical perspective, though, there are differences. And certainly, if you're looking at developed markets, uh, they treat transformation very differently to emerging markets. Uh, we've been involved with a, a number of projects, even this year, and the turn of the last year, which were sort of um, in the emerging market space. And they're far more aggressive in terms of what they're prepared to do for a transformation project. Um, you know, they're happy to go and sort of literally rip out and start again and, uh, and, and transfer everybody over. Whereas, you know, more developed markets tend to do things that are far more um, uh, you know, logical and uh, somewhat more um, less risky fashion, shall we say, and take elements of their, their BSS or OSS and transform those, transform those. Normally, transformation, though, is driven by some other factors. Um, it's not normally just driven by the fact that it's a, you know, a, a, an OPEX cost takeout. It normally is some other positive aspect uh, in terms of revenue, uh, uh, revenue driving, uh, which is going on. So for example, it might be a, a new set of services which need to, uh, to have new systems associated with them. And effectively, those are rolled out first. And then uh, the second phase is really then taking on current, current services or systems and, and bringing those in generally behind them. Um, so I suppose um, uh, the sort of drivers that we're sort of seeing to date, um, interestingly, in the shortest, in the sort of midterm, the sort of um, uh, the sort of work which is going on in terms of the billing systems, we're seeing convergent billing systems eventually taking control, sort of pre and post paid billing, uh, certainly even in developed markets for cost takeout, but also the ability to offer these converged services, which uh, again are driving. Uh, hopefully more interesting um, uh, service options and therefore revenues associated with those. Um, and um, of course, even hardware like uh, the LTE rollouts have also uh, stimulated some activity within terms of transformation as well. 
but it's um, it's carefully done, and um, you know, as I'm saying from a developed markets perspective, it tends to be done rather more gently than the emerging markets. The one other approach I would say has started to have a, an impact. I wouldn't say this is a large part of the market; it's not a massive amount of revenue, but it's just a sheer for, for sheer interest. Is the uh, the M two M market also is looking at um, sort of uh, um, separate stacks for for those activities? It's obviously very low margin. Um, and very high transaction potentially uh, as uh, the M2M services come in. And uh, transformation of, of elements of the OSS and BSS to cope with that are also underway. I've seen a number of RFIs floating around in that space. So I think it really depends on, so you've got to be a little bit careful about the market areas uh, in terms of geographical and, uh, and primarily we know what state that market's in when you talk about transformation. But I certainly agree with the fact that there was certainly less talk of, uh, of transformation uh, at the show this year. Gotcha. Yeah, definitely agree. And I, I really like Justin's point on the difference between the, the emerging and the more developed markets. I mean, it's just fascinating to talk to some of the operators from these different different regions um, because obviously it's, it's such a, a completely different uh, requirements, different environments. Um, and, and I think we are also seeing much more aggressive work being done with rip and replace in, in some of the emerging markets, seems simply because they have really nothing to lose. I mean, often what they have in place is something that they've built or an integrator's built, so it's uh, it's typically not scaling. I think one of the bigger drivers that we see is, is clearly the drive of in mobile mobile broadband, mobile data, and that's obviously driving some of the infrastructure deployments and transformations going on. Whether you're talking about 3G in some of the developed market, uh, developing markets, or LTE in the more mature markets. Um, but also from a software side. I, I think what's interesting to me that I'm tracking closely right now, when you look at the developing markets, often they have a very immediate need. Um, you know, they, they have these phenomenal, um, this competitive environment, they have high churn rates, they're looking to implement something like real-time charging perhaps, upgrading their IM system or upgrading their OSS. I, I think a lot of times they're putting in solutions that are great for the near term, but might not scale. Um, obviously, these regions are facing phenomenal subscriber growth. And as broadband traffic increases, very high transaction volume. Um, as, as these subscribers start using more mobile broadband services. So I think what's going to be interesting to track over the next few years is whether we end up seeing another wave of this type of activity, i.e., some of these COTS out-of-the-box solutions end up hitting a wall. Maybe it's something that the operator got as part of a, a 3G infrastructure deployment, or, or maybe it's something that they just um, got at a relatively low price as a stopgap measure. You just have to wonder if at some point they're just going to run into a wall, and, and we're going to see another wave of, of RFPs and of investment activity. Yeah, you may, may well do, I think, Shira. I, I just there's one thought that came to mind as well on this, and it's just another sort of area of the transformation. and. Um, was really, if you, if you sort of want to clock back a couple of years, um, certainly one of the things that uh, was talked about widely was sort of best of breed and then sort of obviously knitting and integrating those together. And, 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 and partly to your point, Cher, I suppose things have changed a little bit in that sense, and it's partly for acquisitions that have been taking place, and we're going to talk about some of those in a bit, I guess. But, uh, um, but certainly best of suite seems to be the sort of the cry now. So people aren't so worried, well, they aren't unworried, but they, 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 they know the, the cost of integration, and therefore, uh, they'll take a particular business process and want to have a, a somewhat more integrated approach to implementing that to ensure that they aren't going to get stung by a um, you know, huge integration effort. And indeed, uh, not just the, the effort, but the time scales associated with that. And clearly, once you've knitted together a, um, uh, an OSS or BSS architecture from best of breed, quite often it's very intransigent. Effectively, that's going to be a, uh, a suite which is yours and uniquely yours. And so things like upgrades tend to become a bit of a problem. So um, I'd say that one of the sort of the other takeouts from the, the, the conversation is that things have changed a little bit in that front. People are less um, and less dogged about trying to get the very best of breed, but maybe looking at how these things integrate together from a slightly more sort of suite-based perspective um, as they go into the market space. The, uh, you, just for what it's worth, I mean, I think that's a, an, an interesting point, as you, especially as you look at some of the vendors um, that that perhaps come from the equipment side and haven't been necessarily as as uh, as active traditionally in the OSS BSS space 
systems integration capabilities are going to be a, a very big part of their of their value prop just for I think the reasons you just mentioned Justin so that's uh, I think that's a good point to end on and maybe head over to our uh, our, our topic number our, th our third topic for the uh, for the webinar and before we um, before we get to that I'd just like to remind everybody if you do have any questions feel free to tee them up now um, we can uh, you know, we'll, we'll certainly get to them, but um, if a question comes to mind as you hear the panelists talking, by all means, feel free to use the uh, the uh, the question panel. And we touched a little bit on this or talked around it, um, but you know, obviously, companies come to shows like this to make news, and um, three of the of the key aspects I think that that, that we all noticed or, or were at least interested to, uh, to to take away from the show. Are some of the you know the, the the company and product developments that that we saw um, now on the Ericsson Talcordia front? I think that um, there's they have the integration done or they at least have started down the path. Um, but it is such a big it is such a big undertaking and, and should have so much impact on this industry that I think that's worth touching on. Um, Huawei, it, it's hard to, to talk telecom in, in any form or fashion without um, assessing the impact that, that them and, and ZTE and, and some of their, uh, their, their colleagues are having on the market. So they, they certainly came to, uh, to the TM Forum management world with the intent of, uh, of, of making their presence felt. And then, and then you know, I think along those lines, Netcracker absolutely um, came to the show with a uh, – with a, a very strong intent on, uh, on 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 making their voice heard and, and, and telling everyone what they were bringing to the table, especially as a, as a deal with convergence just just was cemented. So, um, I, you know, maybe Shira, can you kick us off by just just hitting on these three and, and telling us, uh, giving us your your sense on what you heard on these three fronts? Yeah, I think they're all part of one macro trend, which is really as the, the, the network itself becomes commoditized, the network equipment providers are realizing that they need to figure out a way to differentiate themselves, to have some sort of a value add, um, basically to, to move away from that commoditization, and they're increasingly getting into software. Um, I think we've seen that even before Ericsson acquired Telcordia. Um, Huawei has been extremely, or attempting to be extremely active in the software market for a while. They have a a separate subsidiary, Huawei Software, and um, really using that as, as sort of to sweeten the deal with some of their their equipment sales. Um, NEC acquired Netcracker. I think it's easy to forget because they've basically operated Netcracker as a larger you know, a separate subsidiary, but it's still definitely part of NEC, and, and I think that's NEC's way of expanding, not just expanding its global presence, but also um, dealing with some of the same margins that the other equipment providers are dealing with. So um, I, I guess I've been doing this long enough to remember back when Lucent bought Keenan for, what, like a, a billion, some crazy amount of money. Um, ADC bought Salvo Systems, and part of me is a little cynical, and I'm wondering, are things really different enough this time around? Ken and Erickson run a Telcordia. Um, should, should equipment providers be in the software market? And, and I think I'm a little more optimistic this time around. I think they've learned from their mistakes, and um, they, they largely understand that software is a very different sales cycle. It's, it's very different buyers within the operator. Um, they're, they're keeping people on board who have come with the acquisitions, so cautiously optimistic that, that this will work. But, you know, of course, it's always any M&A activity is a challenge, and um, I think Ericsson and Telcordia tried their best to, to convey this image that they've, you know, they're working on the integration, it's going smoothly, but, you know, of course you're always going to end up with bumps in the road. Yeah. I think I'd certainly agree with your macro discussion there. I mean, uh, hardware is is definitely, uh, the margins are uh, not failing, but they're definitely harder than they were. Um, and uh, even, even you know, Huawei uh, obviously recognize that as well as they push push ahead in the software and the, and the services game. Um, that's a very three very different sort of companies in terms of their approach. I mean, Huawei really has gone out its way to sort of build everything in-house. That's its stance and grow stuff organically and, and done so extremely successfully in doing so. Um, and uh, they've gone through the, the phases, I guess, of, of OSS and BSS development uh, over, over the years, which has ended up now with quite a mature offering 
which is reasonably well integrated, and clearly they um, they understand that, that that product set, and therefore they don't have a uh, the the issues really that Ericsson and Netcracker will have as they try to integrate uh, disparate uh, software um, purchases, essentially or acquisitions, uh, as they've gone ahead. Um, having said all that, I mean the um, yeah, and again Huawei is sort of uh, very much uh, uh, an integrated company in terms of marketing as well, obviously. The, the Ericsson side and Telcord, as we know, happened last year, and it, it's going to take some time. And I think there are good reasons for it taking some time. I mean, one could be cynical about these things, but effectively there is a, they've got products which do operate in much the same space. They've got tougher choices in terms of trying to figure out uh, you know, how to best look after their customers, how to um, therefore you know, best migrate those, those products, and they've got to really understand the uh, product roadmap for those. So it's, it's quite a difficult um, the thing they've got, they got, they've got ahead of them, and uh, they are taking their time of doing it, and they're trying to preserve um, both Telcordia customers and obviously uh, slide those uh, you know, into a uh, an integrated uh, organisation underneath Ericsson, and they're, 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 they're taking a year to do that. Um, so th it is difficult, I think, for them, and probably out of the three companies here, they've probably got the the larger challenge in some ways. Of course, the the Netcracker. Um, Acquisition of Convergys gives them a, a whole suite of BSS and, and billing, which they didn't have before. Effectively, from a company perspective, the the two product sets are very disparate. And in fact, uh, it appears that most of their customers seem to be pretty disparate as well. So they buy a whole new a set of logos for the for the Netcracker, um, the Netcracker brand, if you like. Um, and of course, the slightly more complicated thing from a sort of branding exercise is that Convergys effectively a uh, only a bit of a very larger convergence, which still uh, stays in the market and still operates and does its uh, traditional business. So they've got a, a bit more of a challenge and, and time scale to try and quickly uh, amalgamate that convergence software uh, division or uh, information management business underneath the Netcracker brand as quickly as possible to you know to stop confusion in the market space. But they can do that in a sense that they uh, they haven't got big product overlap, they haven't got the same challenges that uh, the Ericsson Tech Telcordia. Um, Acquisition is, is presented, um, and it really is just a matter, therefore, of, of figuring out, uh, you know, what you know, what what they should be saying to their customers, and of course, the the integrated roadmap for the product set, which should be relatively straightforward. So, uh, I think, you know, I totally agree with the macro discussion. I think uh, the hardware guys are, are are increasingly looking at services and software as a way to uh, bolster up their margins, um, and I think that will be a trend which will continue. Um, for some time to come, and certainly even uh, the Huawei's of the world, I think Jason mentioned it, that uh, they, they're under pressure as well. I mean, they're under pressure from uh, from the likes of ZTE, who are sort of a few years behind them in terms of their maturity, but certainly from a pricing perspective, highly aggressive, um, and uh, puts them under pressure um, to uh, you know, in terms of their margins and in terms of the customers they're trying to attract. So. I think it's quite an interesting area, um, and I think we'll just, uh, as time goes on, we'll see more of these, and uh, and there'll be less and less logos, and the less and less companies in the OSS and BSS space. So, I guess one question that just popped up in the my mind as I heard you both talking um, about the, the the NEPs trying to get into this, and you know, I see. A fair amount of, of hardware expertise, platform expertise, some services expertise. How important is, I mean, obviously, I think, you know, if you look at Ericsson and Telcordia, at a, at a theoretical level, there's a match between some, some platform capabilities and, and some service capabilities. Huawei, it's certainly, I, I put them in the bucket as, as improving on both fronts, but perhaps not uh, not at a level of, of an Ericsson or, or you know, probably even a Telcordia even on the other side. How much do you think, I mean, is how much of a balance does there need to be between the professional services, systems integration services for the, for the network equipment providers to really make a dent in this market? I think they're very aggressive. I mean, while we announced uh, quite a major deal in Europe um, only this last week, um, so I think they're going for that as well. I think the, the balance-wise, uh, I think from a, I suppose if you look at it like this, where, where there were high margins in the hardware, that was obviously going to be the focus for the business. And as those margins fall, other types of business models look at or, or become more attractive. So things like the service model and the software model therefore have become more interesting from a from a hardware perspective because the margins look more uh, more, more more interesting towards it. 
And certainly, you know, the Ericsson play in this space, and indeed, you know, NEC, that's to say, that Huawei's as well, they've mm. all grown it in this space. And I think sort of a, another macro trend, not just related to um, network equipment providers, but just across the board, is that sort of managed services and services-related revenue from, from vendors is steadily rising. Um, and that's the guys who, you know, um, who are sort of winning out on that as a vendor side of things, that's where the expertise is. It's certainly been the focus over the last couple of years, I believe, mainly because um, you know vendors are looking for scratching around for more for more revenue, and uh, so inevitably, where you'd quite happily hand off a, a piece of uh, integration business or a piece of implementation business to a third party, you're seeing those uh, those vendors actually saying, well, actually, we want to go and do do that bit of business and retain that revenue to keep our you know, to grow our revenue streams and compensate for any fall in uh, in license revenue, which is uh, which I think really has sort of uh, helped prop them up over the last couple of years. Gotcha. All right. Very good. Um, so, moving right along. Now, I mentioned this um, a little bit in the in the sort of the opening of the broadcast, but the Catalyst program is is one of the feature points of the show. Um, and so I, I mentioned it a little bit before, but I'll, I guess it's worth recapping for those folks that aren't necessarily as familiar with it. It's the 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 program which the TM Forum runs, where they they pair um, equipment providers, solution technology providers with network uh, operators in order to solve specific problems. Some of them can be, um, you know, admittedly a little bit more visionary. Um, others are pretty pretty granular in terms of how to go to market with a specific service and. Um, I feel you know it, it was my first time at the show, but I would I came away pretty impressed with the concept of of actually using a trade show to bring um, bring folks together, and and I'll just sort of kick off with some of the things that I liked that I was most impressed with was um, I think in terms of you know under the guise of expanding the TM forum's relevance, and I think you guys might be able to speak to you know where the TM forum is best positioned, and we, and we might talk about that later, but. There was a specific catalyst on the cable space, and it was how to implement and charge for a relatively specific service. And so I thought that was a very nice instance of, of taking a problem that you know perhaps the TM Forum's core constituency um, isn't dealing with, but a a you know a certainly a, an important constituency nonetheless, and, and working on a very important problem. Um, I think in, what fell short, unfortunately, in my book was um, some of the analytics stuff that I saw. Um, I felt that, and going back to the the first slide, that I felt that it was, a, you know, in, in terms of trying to 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 wade through all the analytics um, talk and messaging, I, I sort of expected the catalyst to to, to dig into um, to relatively specific problems, and maybe I just didn't see the right one. But the one I did see tended to be fairly high level, and and so I thought that. Um, you know, that, that fell a little bit short in my book. But um, I'd like to, you know, you guys are obviously the experts in this as far as your familiarity with, you know, the TM Forum's activities throughout the years. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to you guys to talk a little bit about the programs, you know, what's your, what's your assessment of them overall in terms of, of the value that they bring to the table and then some impressions on, uh, on what you saw and what you liked and, and perhaps what perhaps you might have liked to see a little more of. Yeah, the one thing that, that Justin and I were talking a little bit about yesterday in our, our practice call was it, it was I, it was was kind of crunched into one very small space and that was a little disappointing so I spent most of the show not being aware that there was actually a, a second floor of Forumville where you could you know there's a whole I, I think some of the more interesting catalysts I think the cloud catalysts were up there um, so that that was sort of one complaint I had I guess about the way it was actually laid out but you know again having gone to these shows for so long I remember back when they would have something called Bird of the Feather Sessions at the end of every show, and that was sort of the, the genesis of the next show's catalyst. And it's always kind of been a way, I think, for the forum to, to sort of stick its toe in the water and look at maybe adjacent areas, whether it's cloud or whether it's cable, that they're looking at maybe taking a larger role in. And I think we really saw that this year with, with the, um, the real-time charging catalyst. Obviously, the, the forum in the past has not done a ton with with billing, with revenue management. They they bought a billing organization, I think, maybe four years ago. They they bought the GBA. Oh, I would have thought um, so. Yeah, at least four. Well, you know, was it like I, I, it's like all a blur right now. 
And um, I, I just really felt that they've sort of left that opportunity on the table a little bit, not really um, done a whole lot with billing as areas like policy management and real-time charging have, have gained traction, um, as well as kind of operators' larger service delivery environments. I, I felt like they've sort of been a little bit less aggressive in those areas where I think they have the opportunity to really be um, to be thought leaders. And so I was really happy to see this real-time charging catalyst. It's probably the, the one I spent the most time on um, because that's really the area that I cover. And, and I thought it was so much of the discussion around the, the topics of real-time charging and policy management or around how would this work? How would this fit into an operator's larger network? Um, how does it, say, interface with the policy enforcement levels, with um, sort of the existing postpaid billing system, any kind of a prepaid system. And I, I like the fact that this catalyst really kind of hit the nail on the head with that. Gotcha. Justin, yeah. what are you? Uh... Well, a, a catalyst, I think, certainly are uh, uh, extremely useful. I, mean, I think one of the things that Keith Willits talked about in his talk, and indeed he's got a book out, I'm not trying to advertise it, but uh, he did mention it. Essentially, I think um, operators do need to experiment as much as they can. I mean, it's very difficult to second guess, you know, what the next big service is going to be, what's going to drive the market, and um, indeed what sort of uh, things you need to do in terms of your OSS and DSS to, 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 to deliver those. And I think the Catalyst does allow for um, a very low-cost way of actually trying and experimenting some things out. Now, a lot of these things may or may not end up in, you know, live production or anything else. But it does help just discover what's possible. And um, I think from that perspective, it's absolute must. In many ways, um, I sort of feel that uh, the catalysts, as, you, as the Shira was saying, they were quite crammed in into a relatively small area this year. And it is, I think, it's probably one of the more interesting areas. They're sort of effectively, they, you know, they pick a particular use case. They, they build um, you know, a, effectively a working or a near working experimental system. And, and off you go. And it can be extremely useful for vendors as well. So not just from a CSP perspective, but uh, vendors to really understand what the, what's, what, the, you know, what the business case is and what the use case is for a particular scenario. And um, and helps uh, foster those things. And, and you know, once in a while, they do end up, as I say, in, in some sales. So I'd, uh, I kind of recommend from a vendor's perspective, it's something they should definitely get involved with. But I think probably more importantly, from the CSP's perspective, it is very hard to get these things underway internally within a CSP, uh, 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 and uh, specifically the uh, the more speculative stuff which goes on. And I would thoroughly recommend that the CSPs throw their weight behind a few more of these to uh, to try to try and experiment on on some things which are really you know a little bit out of their comfort zone. The other thing I would say it does also allow for um, for uh, multi, not only multi-vendor, but multi-party uh, CSPs to, to join up on some functions and, and, and things as well. And clearly, as time moves on, I think that CSPs have to increasingly look outside of their network domain and, uh, and actually cooperate a little closer um, with uh, some of their potential competitors, but potentially some of their partners as well. And I think this provides a nice... Um, environment in which they can experiment with some of these thoughts and, and things in terms of the systems which might need to be at play to do these these sorts of things. And uh, so really I think, you know, I, I think it's a good idea. I just think it could be taken just that little bit further, but it does need the support primarily of the, the CSPs to drive this stuff. And it should be looked on as a, I think as an experimental area and a trial area, but then acted upon hopefully with uh, Know, with some, some, some real concrete results coming out of it. So I, 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 you know, this year, I think, was much like any other. I just think the logical space, the physical space that we're given is quite tight. Um, and I'd love to see just a, a larger area to allow, um, allow people to, to really understand what's going on with each one of those catalysts. So I think some of them had some, uh, some pretty good stuff going on there, but it wasn't exposed in, in quite the same way that I think it had done, uh, or had been rather down in, uh, in Nice in previous years. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I, you know, I just, again, for what it's worth, my perspective was I think that there was, I tended to feel like there was a bit, it was a bit short on space, especially if you if you tried to to, to look in on a demo that perhaps there was one other person, um, you know, looking in on it, it the, the space did get a little tight, so maybe that's something that uh, a larger convention center might be able to remedy a little, little bit. Um, and so we're, we're running almost to the point where we should start taking questions, but I wanted to... Uh, 
to just end things, and Shira mentioned revenue management. I think that's obviously an important topic um, to 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 discuss in a, a wee bit more depth. And then, and Justin made a few recommendations already, but um, just give you guys a, the opportunity for some some last words on on some things that you know that, that you feel might have been important at the show that we haven't addressed right now. And then any uh, and, and any parting thoughts for the TM forum for next year. So, sure, do, do do your thing on revenue management, or I'm very happy to say. I mean, I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll pass a little comment on the first uh, point certainly, and then we can maybe come back to recommendations. Mm -hmm. I, w I would say um, to share a uh, obviously TMF bought a, a billing uh, organisation a few years ago, and uh, it has steadily built up in terms of uh, being an important part of the show. I and mean, certainly, if you go to any uh, operator, you must bear in mind at least 25% of their OSS and BSS spend goes on billing systems. Um, it's a good chunk of their revenue, and certainly in a, 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 an operation without a bidding system doesn't happen. And certainly more and more innovative stuff that, stuff that tends to take place within, a, within an operator, which is sort of impacts the customer and impacts revenue, tend to be all billing, billing related. And so I was, I was pleased to see that you know, effectively there were two um, programs this year that uh, really, you know, uh, was a lot better than the customer mind back a few years when there was sort of the back end of the week and it was one small bit of the program. And I think this is a reflection, really, of um, the maturing of what goes on within CSPs. Um, everything does boil back down to money, and uh, there have to be ways of generating and monetizing what they do and doing it better and more effectively so they can afford the more expensive things like the network, which is rolling out, you know, things like LTE, which is extremely expensive. And uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, from my perspective, um, you know, very careful thought going into, you know, do we need to roll out LTE everywhere? Can we actually afford to do it? And if we do, how are we going to pay for it? Um, and all that boils effectively back down to the, the revenue management systems associated with, uh, with, the, with the rollout. So I was pleased to see that it, it, it had bolstered. I think there's a little bit further to go. Certainly, if you go and speak to CSPs, it's normally one of the things that uh, it gets picked up fairly early on in terms of how you're going to, uh, how you're going to pay for stuff. And uh, I think Probably the, the sentiment was pretty much right this year um, in terms of monetization and looking at those new services and you know, cloud-based services, M2M, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but how they get monetized is, I think, was probably a top-of-the-mind issue in terms of all these, uh, all, all the possible topics they could be talking about. So uh, that, that was my point on revenue management. I don't know if Sherry's got uh, any other angle on that. Happy to take that no, and then I, maybe I come back I, to the recommendation. I discussed it to death, so we can move on. So uh, just some thoughts for next year. If I had a magic wand, I mean, I'd, I'd have a magic wand. It would be in Nice, and it has been moved back to Nice, which is good news. You're um, really powerful, Justin. Yeah, <laughs> I am so powerful. Um, so that is good news, I think, all around. And I think there's a general sentiment that was probably a good thing. But uh, leaving that aside, um, I just find a couple of things a little bit irritating. And this is obviously from a, an analyst's perspective opposed to a vendor or a... Uh, a CSP's perspective, but it's quite a short show, and particularly the time on the uh, exhibition floor is effectively quite restricted. Uh, I know the reasoning behind it, but effectively, if you're trying to get around that floor and have a number of meetings on it, inevitably it's opening up late and, and shutting down a little bit early. Um, and uh, I think that there could be something about uh, maybe lengthening that time on the floor a little bit uh, more than it is. And the other one, really just from a personal thing as well, I spend a lot of time obviously going from meeting to meeting and company to company, and certainly the, uh, the location in Dublin, lovely as it is, um, essentially is spread over three to four floors, and I find myself <laughs> running up and down the, uh, the escalators and, uh, and lifts to get to the right spot at the right time, and I think that needs some, some thinking. Um, I've already mentioned about the catalyst. I think that's a, a, a really interesting area. It's a unique um, proposition that the TMF bring to the market, and I think that needs to be emphasized just a little bit more than it has been. Um, and um, I think the other thing which vendors always ask me for is just more access to the uh, to the CSPs. I mean, they were there, um, and they were tied up, or they were doing talks, but uh, it's very difficult for a, um, for a CSP who hasn't prearranged, and there's a message there, any meetings, um, that they do find it difficult to meet them. And uh, I think anything to help help that activity um, would, be, would be great. So just some, just some thoughts. Yeah, I'm interested to see what the layout ends up being in Nice, because as I understand it, they're, they've basically redone the uh, Acropolis, which is good, because that place is falling apart. 
So I'm curious to see how they end up with doing the layout. And you know, definitely agree with Justin. This, those escalators kind of gave me vertigo after a while. Um, so the layout could could definitely be better. The one thing, though, you know, Jason had mentioned CTIA, and and that's obviously this becomes such a diversified show. I mean, that that's got the infrastructure guys are maybe what thirty percent, and the rest of it's kind of cell phone apps and cell phone bling. Um, with that kind of being less of a factor and, and all of the smaller OSS and billing shows disappearing, I, I think the forum has a real opportunity to capitalize not just on the OSS market, but also on some of these, these areas that we've discussed, cloud and real-time charging and policy, um, just you know, kind of new, new business opportunities. Um, there, there's certainly, you, you've got sort of the big show like Mobile World Congress. Um, but there aren't really any other, with the exception of a couple very specialized shows, that there's not too much of a, of a forum such as the TMF out there for some of those other areas. So I, I think it's a real opportunity mm. for, for the forum to take a role as, as sort of a, a facilitator and, and bringing people together, not just in the core OSS space, but also adjacent areas, whether you're talking um, you know, subscriber data management or service delivery platforms or policy management. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, I mean, I think I've probably mentioned this to you before, but I mean, I was in the same venue three weeks earlier for a uh, for a vendors, uh, well, for Teradata, to be easy about it, um, event, and the um, you know that floor was just full of uh, analytics companies, and all of which pretty much had an angle or some angle on to telcos. Um, and really, if you you know, there's plenty of scope for increased number of vendors uh, in that space. Um, but it required just a bit of um, you know, rejigging of what the messaging is from a from a TMS perspective, and I think there's there's potential out there for those sort of vendors as well. And I think it'd be, be extremely interesting from a um, from a from a CSP's perspective to have those guys at that same event as well, because they they use all the same data, it's, uh, and it's uh, increasingly they're being amalgamated together in terms of the use cases. So I think it'd be quite interesting how to go and explore. Very good. Um, so I think it's a good uh, a good note to end on, and actually sort of segues into one of the first questions that uh, that came in a little bit ago. And, and at this point, I'd I'd like to to welcome anybody who has some questions now that the uh, the entire the entire program has been gone through. If you have any questions for the panelists, feel free to to submit those now. But one one came in a little bit earlier, and I think it uh, you know it it. it, it kind of circles back to analytics and um, talking about, you know, it, it says that the, Justin mentioned there was a lot of, there was a lot of ways of, of using these tools to, to different ends. Um, and I think as I, I made a note here that Justin, you, you mentioned service assurance as being one uh, very important aspect in your mind. But, but the question is, can you, can you guys rank, or if it's possible, can you rank some of the important um, some of the important tools I, that, that operators should be looking to implement in terms of, of a priority. If you had to rank or prioritize which analytics tools or which type of, um, of capabilities that are most, uh, most important right now, um, do you have any, any sense of what those might be? Oh, well, that's a, that's a $6 million question and a half hour answer, I guess. Um, I mean, I did a, did a project not that long ago, which I think we ranked out, I think we had about 128 different use cases um, for, the, for the, um, the ranking. So there are some variables in this. So it depends on the maturity of the, of the market which you're addressing. So for instance, if you're in a developed market, the chances are you've already got some kind of a churn management model in play. That doesn't mean you can't improve upon that, but certainly if you go to some of the emerging markets, Africa and uh, South America, where churn is a massive issue, and, and, and uh, more often than not, they haven't actually got uh, churn management uh, systems in play. Prediction models, you'd certainly put the rank that has been a fairly high uh, prioritization. The other thing you've got to bear in mind is the split, um, if you're looking at mobile uh, world for a second, in terms of the, uh, the churn rates associated with prepaid and postpaid. So of course there's different information sources associated with that. So that's another variable you have to bring into play, and you treat those things very differently. Um, so in more broad broad terms, um, I would say that um, certainly if you're looking at so any of the marketing functions um, uh, associated with churn are fairly mature, and if you haven't put those in, that would be certainly a prioritised area which you could look at. Um, and uh, you know there are. Even in, mat in uh, mature or developed markets, there's some interesting things going on with social network analysis. That's not social network 
um, based information that's based on CDRs and who calls what, and you prioritize against those. But effectively, it's a segmentation discussion that's going on. Um, interesting areas happening um, beyond that. Um, we're looking at some uh, uh, use cases associated with networks and network analytics to help prioritize uh, not just in terms of um, uh, who you uh, uh, to, to sort of basically do root cause analysis, but also in terms of determining, um, you know, build out which ones to be prioritized based on revenues, et cetera, and indeed where your, uh, your, uh, uh, your most profitable customers might be. So there's a whole heap of activity in that space, which is which is up and coming and looks quite interesting and, and certainly has some real uh, cost benefits in terms of network build out. Beyond that, there are, of course, the more traditional ones, and revenue, associate, uh, revenue um, assurance is definitely one of them. Um, and uh, if you look at some of the uh, more mature markets, there's some quite sophisticated models in play. If, again, if you look at the emerging, uh, the emerging markets, there's, uh, there's very little. And um, again, you know, so depending on your market area, you want to prioritize some of those. But uh, you know, really, it can be anything for anything. Uh, CEM, I suppose we could be describing as being analytics, I think we did in this call. Um, and that's an area which is still is, is immature level, I'd say, at the moment. Uh, but certainly there are um, uh, there are a number of different factors which could be, be driving that, and that may be sort of a latter latter thing. So I think, uh, in short, you've, it's not an easy answer, and it depends on a number of different variables, uh, and so it depends on the um, you know the market maturity and what you've got in play today. So I can't really prioritise them, but certainly uh, I think I've covered some of the more obvious ones to go and touch upon. Um, but happy to uh, to have a chat if someone wants to have a have a call about it. Okay. Sure, absolutely. Shira, wanna wanna try to top that? No, I, I'm not even <laughs> gonna try. I'm just gonna maybe add a couple more thoughts. Um, revenue assurance, and obviously, as a subset of that, is fraud management. And and again, it really, like Justin said, it really does vary by by region. But so when you, particularly when you start talking about putting uh, SIM cards into non-human devices, I, I think you introduce the potential for fraud, and that's something that's maybe underestimated a bit. I was reading somewhere that in South Africa. The, uh, the SIM cards in uh, traffic lights got uh, got stolen and used to rack up a tremendous amount of, uh, of call traffic. So, you know, things like that I think are, are undervalued a bit, the, the value of being able to uh, to identify when a device acts in a way that's, that's not really supposed to be acting that way. Um, and the other thing that I've been hearing more, it's a subject that's been discussed quite a bit recently, but I'm hearing more interest is the idea of customer profitability. So, of course, turn management is important, but the more, you know, one step further is, is being able to really analyze your customers and what the relative prof profitability is, and, and the concept is that maybe not every customer is actually worth keeping. So, I, I think I've seen a surge of interest, particularly in the more developed markets around that. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that's... Uh that I, I agree. That's something that I've I've started to, to hear more about, and that's uh, that's certainly uh, an interesting concept. Um, so we're running a little short on time, but there is a couple more questions that I I feel are, are fairly important. And Shira, you mentioned a little bit about this um, going back to point three um, with you know when we were talking about some of the network equipment providers moving into the uh, to the software space, and it's it's obviously nothing new. Um, but a tricky, a tricky proposition for sure. So, are there the question? Are there a, are there any key success factors, um, sort of top level success factors that you guys can identify that would perhaps um, would be perhaps useful or help you know this time around um, to to attack the space a little bit more effectively? I'm sure you mentioned a little bit of that with uh, with Erickson in your answer. A few slides back, but um, is there any any elaboration you guys can 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 provide as far as you know some of the things that, that NEPS might need to uh, to keep in mind as they as they sort of begin the cycle anew? I think some of it applies to any M and A activity. So particularly when you're acquiring a company with a very different focus, um, such as a hardware company acquiring a software company. Uh, retention becomes much more important, both from sort of the, the actual engineering side as well as the sales side. I think the importance of keeping sales folks on board that, that speak software is, is underestimated, and I think that's critically important. Um, you're, you're typically talking to very different constituencies within the operator. Um, 
the, you know, and, and often I think when you're talking about adding software capabilities as a value add to a hardware sale, um, there, you know, there's a possibility that the, the, the network guys are simply going to, um, you know, just why not? You know, this is this is a, a value add, and we'll take it. But you'll get pushback from the actual users of the software who might want different functionality or feel that the solution isn't uh, possibly isn't convergent or scalable enough. So it, it's um, you're not necessarily going to be selling into the same people. Um, and I think it's also important for whether you're talking about Ericsson or, or whoever the next acquisition may be to to keep the software business as an independent organization in some way. Um, to, I think to really continue to be a, a viable player in the market, it, it, you've got to have standalone sales. You can't just simply be bundling your software into, uh, into the infrastructure. Um, so I think that's something to think about going on is, is keeping the company you're acquiring as of an ongoing business concern. Very good. Great points. So we are at the top of the hour, but Justin, any, any final words on the subject? Um, not particularly. I, I would say, though, that um, you know, we shouldn't necessarily throw the baby out of the bathwater in the sense that you know, what hardware vendors are, are good at is, uh, is simplifying the sale. Um, putting parameters around what they're selling so that so people clearly understand what it is. And, and maybe there's a few lessons from software. <laughs> they could learn from the hardware vendors, some of these software vendors, um, in just making it a little bit easier and parameterizing things a bit better. I would say also that really, and I think I think now the uh, even from stalwart, uh, just hardware vendors have, have been dragged into the uh, the software game. Um, you know, it's it's part and parcel of the same thing. I don't think there's going to be any hardware vendors who don't have a software play uh, to date and, uh, and may, may continue. I think it's an integral part of it, and it's certainly the most important part in terms of monetizing that hardware, which is uh, it's still extremely expensive and certainly not getting any cheaper if you're looking at things like LTE. So mm. I think the two things are wed together uh, henceforth. Gotcha. Very good. Well, as I mentioned, we are uh, a bit over time, so... Um, we will. We are going to to shut down right now. But I want to thank very much my two panelists. I thought it was a, a very interesting discussion. And um, like I said, any of the questions that we weren't able to get to, we will we will be sure to follow up. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending and wish everyone a good afternoon or evening. Bye now. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Jason. Bye. Thanks, thank everybody. You.